Well, every day with Joe is a perfect day, but what happens when we all go away? What happens when we go home and we're not here with this group? How do we keep having perfect days every day? Well, the answer is to base your days on your values. Because when you have complete clarity about what you want to achieve in life, then you can have complete clarity about what you need to do every day. But when you don't know your values and when you don't live your values, that's when you end up allowing other people to steal time from you. And when they steal time from you with long phone calls, too many meetings, projects that really don't meet your values, every one of those minutes stolen is stealing from your children, from your spouse, from your hobbies, from your health, and from you building your legacy. So what we need to do today is build your perfect day. And we're going to do that by using the formula. It all starts with having your pyramid of values. Now, in the pyramid of values, there's going to be four things. There's going to be family, health, wealth, and experiences. And those pyramid of values are going to drive you into making the right decisions with your time every single day so that time is not stolen from you. So we're going to go through some worksheets that I have for us. But I'm going to read you my answers first before we hand those out. So the one thing that I'm going to ask you is, in 20 years from now, what would you regret not doing or achieving? And then you're going to answer that in relation to the four values, family, health, wealth, and experiences. So for me, in 20 years from now, what would I regret having not achieved? For my family, it's not having a family, and it would be to not have a, uh, let my mother have a grandkid. So right now she is a step uh, grandson, but she doesn't have a grandson from my sister or from myself. And so that is something that I know I have to work on. That is my number one priority in life. And right now my mother is 75 years old, she's got great energy, but in 10 years from now, when she starts to slow down a little bit, if she doesn't have that grandkid, you know, she's not going to be able to give that energy that she has right now and today. And so that is something that I'm focusing on every day. For me, for my health, it's living long and vigorously. Now, some people might be getting back into health. Some people might have more advanced health goals. Or it might be marathon running or might be something like that, some type of competition. Your values are going to be your values. They're not going to be the same as mine. But that's my health value. For wealth, it's not a number. For me, it's being debt-free for being financially free. But for some people, it might be having a business that is sold for a certain dollar figure. It might be having a certain number in the bank. It is your value. Whatever it is, you need to be as clear and concise as possible. And then finally, experiences. What are the experiences that you would regret not having achieved in 20 years from now? For me, when I was younger, I was lucky. I did a lot of these bucket list things, and now they no longer bring me that fulfillment. For me right now, it's to write three books, three books that make a big impact. So I believe already, I've already written one, but I want to write two more. So those are my four value answers. In 20 years from now, I need to make sure that I have built my family, that I've lived and made the right habit choices so that I can live long and vigorously, that I always want to have that feeling of freedom with my wealth, and that I continue to focus my days on writing my three books. And so these four values make it really easy for me to design my day. And that's what I'm going to help you do now. So Eunice, we can pass out the forms now. And everyone is going to be able to work through these sheets with me as we go from our values down to designing your perfect day. Because what happens is first world problem. The biggest first world problem is comparison syndrome. So we see other people. We see other people doing things, and we think, oh, look at them. They have more success than us. They must be doing something, something that's working for them. And so we go, and we see the grass is greener on the other side, and we chase these shiny objects. And when we do that, it actually brings a lot of stress into our lives because we're doing what other people value, and it takes us away from our values. And when we are away from our values, it brings a lot of stress into our life. And so what we're going to have at the end of going through this worksheet is an epiphany. We're going to have that epiphany moment 
that's going to allow us to make the decisions that we're able to follow our perfect day and not be stressed and not want to do anything else. So we're going to open it up to page, page two. And I want you to take a couple of minutes right now and answer in 20 years from now, what would you regret not doing or achieving for each of the four values in the pyramid? Family, health, wealth, and experiences. And over on page three, you see my answers. I want you to be as clear and concise and specific as possible. All right, now you know how your perfect day should look like, but there's some obstacles in the way, I'm sure. So on page five, we are going to destroy those obstacles. And the way to do that is to come up with two solutions for every obstacle in the way of you having a perfect morning, a perfect afternoon, a perfect evening, and a perfect bedtime. Because the philosophy that I have is for any obstacle in the way of your life, as long as you have a plan A and plan B, you'll be able to overcome those obstacles. So for example, on page six, in the morning, classic obstacle, hitting snooze and getting behind. Well, plan A could be that you place the alarm across the room or that you get one of those Philips light alarms that naturally adds light to the room to wake you up. Or plan B, you could hire a personal trainer that you have to train with uh, four days a week and pay for the sessions three months in advance. Now, nobody in here wants to waste the money and that'll get you out of bed. So come up with the solutions to overcoming your obstacle in the morning, whether it is getting out the door on time or getting the kids out the door on time. In the afternoon, a classic obstacle is that the team mem member emergencies come to us, right? Everybody has deadlines and fires that we have to put out for them. So how do we come up with plans to overcome those obstacles? Well, plan A is that you could have a chain of command. You could make them go through an assistant or a general manager before it reaches you. Or plan B, you could have do not disturb hours and open door hours so that you block off more of your time. In the evening, you're late for dinner. That's a big obstacle so many entrepreneurs have. You could have plan A, public accountability. There's nothing more effective than public accountability. Telling your team members that, hey, I leave the office here at 5.30 p.m. every day. And if they still see you sitting there at 6 o'clock at night, you're going to feel like a hypocrite, and the world is not like a hypocrite, and we don't like to feel like hypocrites. So public accountability is key to helping overcome any obstacle that you want to do. You can also take away your incentives, take away your rewards. So if you enjoy a glass of wine with dinner, and you're late, you don't get home at 5.30, or you don't have dinner at 7 o'clock, then you don't get your glass of wine. So come up with the plan A and plan B to overcome all of your obstacles, and the final one there is bedtime. Most of us stay up later than we want to. What is it? What is it getting in the way? What are those obstacles? What are the solutions? So plan A, if you're staying up 30 minutes late every night, set the alarm before you go to bed. In fact, often the alarm at night is just as important as the alarm to get you out of bed. 60 minutes before bed, you set the alarm. That means turn off the electronics and start your bedtime routine and ritual to wind down. You could also have a cutoff time for your Netflix, for your electronics, for all of those things that allow you to get to bed at the hour you want to get to. So one obstacle for each time of day, and then two solutions for each, and that's how you get ahead here. So let's have you fill that out right now on page five.
All right, and now the best time, the best part of it all, we get to put all of that together and build out your perfect day. So if we skip to the last page, page eight, taking into account my values, family is the most important thing to me, living long and vigorously, making sure that I'm going to build in exercise and good nutrition into my day, and then the experiences, writing the books is so important to me, and so that allows me to build this day. Yes, I wake up early. I start writing at 4 o'clock. I write my first 1,500 words before 5 o'clock, meditation, exercise, walk the dog, breakfast time, maybe a little bit more writing in. I've got this scheduled out, time blocks, hour by hour. In the afternoon, I'm all written out, and so that's when I do podcasts or videos. And then I end the day relatively early, around 4 o'clock, walk the dog again, family time, dinner time, and early bedtime. And that just falls in line with my value pyramid. So if people come along and say, Craig, do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? I'm able to run that through my values pyramid and say, no, it just doesn't take me towards my big goals and dreams. So knowing yours, I want you to go and fill out what your perfect day should look like that's going to allow you to have big accomplishments every single day and move you towards those big goals and dreams. Social support. So on the side, great question, Richard. So on the right-hand side there, we see the five pillars for success. Those are from the book. And you need better planning and preparation than ever before. You need professional accountability, which is like a coach or mentor. You need positive social support. And what I've found, Richard, was this is from what I learned from my weight loss transformation clients, that they need to just be surrounded by good, positive people. So everybody in this room is your positive social support. They might not give you expert advice, but they'll pick you up when you're feeling down. Community is so powerful, and that's what we all need. So we need that third pillar. We need a meaningful incentive. We need to dig deep into our hearts and minds to figure out why we're making these changes. And then finally, fifth, big deadlines. You need deadlines and everything. So what do you need to get done every day at the end of that day in order it for it to be that perfect day? All right, so time is up. Did everybody come and build a nice, perfect day there? Something that was based on their values so that they're having a better day now than what they may have been following in the past where people were able to come and steal time from you? Because that's the one thing that I want to get across today is that every minute that you allow to be stolen by newsletters, by Facebook videos, by YouTube videos, is stealing from things far more important from your children, from your family, and from your legacy. And with your values pyramid, you're able to build that perfect day so that you can have perfect days every day and build your perfect life. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video and I wanna let you know that I have a new book that's come out and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description or you can wait till the end of this video or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. So, Craig, I've, I've really crafted some questions here to really get into some good stuff. So, uh, you're the discipline and productivity guy, but surprisingly, before you even start scheduling your day, you say there's, um, there are much more important things to think about. So, tell us about the three V's every entrepreneur needs to know before moving on with their day. Yeah, absolutely. So, you need to start with your values first. So, imagine like you have a time pyramid. And so at the top is where you would have actually what you're gonna do in the day. But at the bottom, you're gonna put in your values because your values are gonna drive every single thing that you do. If your values are family first, it's gonna drive how you start your day, what you do over the course of the day, how much you work. So you had that example yesterday, Joe, of the guy who was thinking about opening his 57th hardware store right. and he was overweight and not spending any time with his family. Listen, you can make them super productive at opening hardware stores, but it's the wrong thing. And a lot of people in entrepreneurship become super productive at the wrong thing. And so I ask one question of all the coaching clients that I work with, which is, in the next 20 years, what do you want to accomplish in the four top values in your life? Your family, your health, your wealth, and experiences. That's where everything has to start. So once you know that, I want to raise great kids, 
Okay, good. That means no 13-hour days for you. It's very simple to start planning your day that way. So it's values first on the bottom of the foundation of the pyramid. That's the strongest rock that you start with. Then on top of that is something that Dean was talking about yesterday, which is your vision. That's where you get to next. Values drive your vision. And then you have to know your value of your time. So if you take a look at all the you know, people in here, like an income level at the bottom line would be $500,000 a year probably. So that means every single hour of your working day is worth $250. Now who here is willing to admit that they're still doing stuff like running errands, going to the UPS store, cutting the lawn, making meals, all this stuff, even, even writing a book. And I know that a lot of female entrepreneurs, you are guilted into it by mother-in-law or by mother, right? You are still making all the meals, you're still doing all the cooking, and it's killing you because you're trying to run this business at the same time. Now, I remember back in 2009, watching an Evan Pagan video, and Evan said in the video, entrepreneurs can't be doing their laundry. And, and when I first saw that, I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I'm doing my laundry. I'm wasting all this time that it, all this stuff is below my value. So if your value is $250 or more per hour, that's a lot of money you can put into having people do everything for you. And that's the mindset you have to have as you go and schedule in your day. Even if you want to write a book, think about writing a book how long is it going to take you if you're not a writer? But you know you have a great book in you, right? It's going to take you over 100 hours. Now, if your time is worth $250, and it's going to take you more than 100 uh, hours to write a book, just pay Tucker 25 grand and get the book done so much faster. That's who I've used for both of my books, and it saves me a ton of time. So you have to have that type of thinking. Starts with your vision, or your values, your vision, and the value that you put on yourself and it's gonna make you a whole bunch of time to then focus on what matters. So what Tony said yesterday, the one problem in his life is time. I bet you if I spend a full day with Tony, I could save him or make him 30 minutes of time, and if the guy's running $6 billion worth of revenue in companies, that's gonna be worth a lot to him. I can yes, do that for what, what we should do, I'll take the video of this and I'll take that clip and send it to Tony. Good. And see, see if he does that. Yeah, and I mean, this guy's <laughs> done all of that stuff better than anybody. Oh. Well, yeah, so that's my next question. So, Bedros, uh, you and Craig, you guys have been working together for about a decade, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah, about a decade. And you've created a whole winning system um, by watching pretty much what this guy does. Yeah. Because he's very much that guy. And by the way, let me mention this because I didn't do this. I've gone, th I've, I've gone through Craig's whole process, spent a day and a half with him. Uh, amazing. And really just such a, a, a great thinker. So um, tell us how uh, having clarity of path and becoming a disciplined entrepreneur allowed you to you know, go from anxiety attacks to, and tremors, which you were having, uh, to a $25 million business, I think it is approximately, yeah. and uh, one of the fastest growing fitness franchises on the planet. Well, I've had the good fortune of, before he ever wrote the book, The Perfect Day Formula, and before he ever had the Perfect Life workshops that I've gone through as well, I've had the good, good fortune of having environmental exposure to this guy. And, and if you haven't had a chance to have environmental exposure to Craig, it's, it's a unique experience. He's, your gift, his gift, is outside eyes. And so at first I would laugh, like, why, why is it that you want to have dinner at 5.30? That's, that's kind of like a late lunch for me, right? Why aren't we partying? Because, you know, we run masterminds together, Miami, San Diego, Las Vegas, uh, Tennessee. We're having good time. We're in great, great cities, man. Let's, like, party till midnight. What do you mean you're going to bed by 9 o'clock? What gives? But I soon started realizing that as I was laughing, I was having anxiety attacks when I'd go home and essential tremors. I would just lock up and freeze, and my wife would just like look at me like, what's going on? And I very quickly realized that his life structure is what I need if I plan on taking this franchise that was just puttering along and really making it reach its fullest potential. And I'm far from that. Our goal is 2,500 locations by the year 2020. We've got 614 locations as of yesterday uh, that are actually open and more in development. Um, but the life structure and discipline that I've been able to witness from him, never mind reading the book and, and, and experiencing it firsthand from the workshop, has been a game changer for me. And for most leaders, most of us in here, and I know you can, uh, you've experienced this where you feel like you're overwhelmed with opportunity. You truly have more opportunities than you have time 
left on the calendar. That's the reality of it. You try and put so many irons in the fire, and that's what I was doing. And at the end of the day, I realized, what is my biggest purpose on this planet? I'm still a personal trainer. It's just now I'm going to touch millions of lives through our Fit Body Bootcamp franchise, and I'll touch lives of people who'll never know me. But I'll I'll be a bigger trainer than Tony Little and Jillian Michaels through our franchise. So why am I striking up a deal with this guy? Why can't I? Why am I doing another event here when my purpose is to be the world's biggest trainer, making an impact in people's health, fitness, lifestyle, self-esteem, self-image? And so I went narrow and deep on my focus of Fit Body Bootcamp, and it went from failing in 2012, 13, and anxiety attacks, and I was in a very dark, negative place, uh, taking Vicodin and NyQuil every night to go to sleep, to now a $25 million company and growing where I have two VPs running the organization and a leadership team, and then, of course, implementers who execute our vision. And that's really, if you're in this room, you're a visionary. You just come up with the vision and the path, and you execute to your high-performance team. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video, and I want to let you know that I have a new book that's come out, and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description, or you can wait till the end of this video, or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. Okay, so then, so from what I'm getting from you, um, you're in this place, you then learn how to structure, and so that pretty much is designing your day. So how does one go about doing that and starting that? Okay, so I speak to a lot of uh, fitness gym owners and stuff like that. And so I use this phrase, the champion mindset, in that all these fitness gym owners, they've, at one point in their life, they've either been a champion athlete in college or they've been a bodybuilder or something like that. And so they're very successful in one area of their life, but then they struggle with sales or they struggle with their time management. And I say to them, listen, you've already been really, really, really successful here. You've put the systems in place. And so all you have to do is transfer that champion mindset over to this other area in life where you're struggling. Um, so that is just thinking like, okay, well, it's planning and preparation. It was having a coach. It was having a deadline. It was getting the accountability. It was having all those things. And so whatever it is that you guys are good at, wherever you have had great success in life, you just have to transfer that over to having the systems in your own, in your own produ productivity. So can I tell you... Um, a very embarrassing story about how I almost fought Sean Stevenson. Yes, 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 that was so, wonderful. So I hired <laughs> Sean, I hired Sean for his breakthrough day uh, earlier this year. And it's a, it's a heck of a day, and I was going to him because I have all the, the productivity and stuff in place, but I wasn't getting into deep emotional relationships. And so Sean was helping me through that, and he showed me by the end of the day of our 12 hours together that I had basically built myself a system to stop myself from getting into deep emotional relationships with, uh, with women. So it was, I was building myself a prison essentially. And Sean pointed that out to me and I was very angry at Sean for pointing it out to me because I didn't like to be shown that I'm not perfect. And so, right, right. <laughs> Sean said money up front if you can. Money yeah. up front, I love that. <laughs> so so Sean, Sean was actually, were you terrified? Were you worried? I was... Maybe we could grab him a mic. Uh, Sean yeah. was concerned because Thanks, we were both Pastor. standing there and staring at this whiteboard where he had pointed out that I had built this prison for myself. Um, and, and so it sucked. I didn't want to admit it. Was it. There, there was shame. Like It was like, how the hell did I create this very problem that I claim that I don't want? And that's the hardest part about it. Yeah, and so, so he pointed out to me that I built this system that put me in a bad place. And then I realized, hey, I can just go and dismantle that system and build a new system that allows me to have what I want. And I've since done that, and thank you, Sean, for pointing that out. But it just goes to show you that if you've built a system, like there's a lot of great marketers in here who might struggle with family relationships or uh, their health and you've built a great marketing system. You can go and do the same thing for your time management, for your health, for your family relationships. It's all just about building systems that work for you. 
and the five things that we use, that I've used to build systems for anything that can change your life in any way is having better planning and preparation than ever before, having professional accountability, which is going to give you expert advice and someone to hold you accountable and not let you get away with anything. Third is positive social support. So that's being in a room like this. You know, you might not get breakthrough ideas from everybody in here, but they're going to pick you up when you're feeling down. Fourth is having a meaningful incentive. So we're not doing things for money or stuff. It's what matters in life is people and experiences. So a meaningful incentive has to come from your heart, not from your wallet. And then finally, the big deadline. There has to be a deadline in the behavioral change that you want to make. And if you have those five things in place, you can do anything in life. You can lose weight, you can get rich, you can find the love of your life, the home of your dreams, whatever you want, if you use those five things. So just put them in place, build the systems you want for your time, for your family, uh, for your making a million bucks. So, and so when you focused on this thing, I mean, I guess the way uh, is that's the big picture thing for you mm -hmm. that you needed to build things around. Absolutely. So, so like, how, how do you structure your day? Like, what does your day look like, and how can people in this room structure their day? Well, the most important thing is that you get up. It doesn't matter what time you get up. So I get up early in the morning, but you don't have to get up really early in the morning. What you need to do first thing in the morning when you get up is focus on your number one priority in life for 15 minutes. And the reason why I say that is because most people don't spend 15 minutes a day without electronics thinking about their number one priority in life. It could be an opportunity to take advantage of, or it could be a problem that you're going through. If you give yourself 15 minutes a day, six days a week, for 52 weeks in a year, that's 72 hours of clear, uninterrupted thinking. And you can write a book in that time, you can do anything you want, but most people don't do it. And most people, does anybody in here get stressed out before 8 o'clock because of their morning routine has too much crap in it? You know, you, you have to do meditation, you have to do gratitude journaling, you have to do freeform journaling, you have to do exercise, you have to do yoga with JP, and you have to do interpretive dance. Like, you have to do all of that before 7 in the morning, according to, like, these articles that you see on the Internet. And most people are getting stressed out. So don't do any of that stuff. Instead, just sit there and think. Go down to your kitchen table, think on your number one priority for 15 minutes, and then the rest of your day, it can go any which way you want, but you've already had that victory. That's the most important thing. If I can just give you one piece of advice, that's it. That wasn't bad. That was not bad. Can I, can I share something where that's concerned too? And it's really made a big change in my life. I'm sure it'll make a big change in yours is every single person's morning routine needs to start the night before. And again, this is through environmental exposure through Craig. I've learned more by watching this guy than ever by asking him questions. Because sometimes when you're, when you're the problem, you don't know what questions to ask to get out of the problem. But when you watch, you learn. And even in the evenings now, as soon as I get home, after the first hour of being home, I just turn my phone on silent in airplane mode, and I leave it alone. Anything that happens work-wise, I'm not going to be able to solve it 7, 8, 9 o'clock in the evening, number one. Number two, I don't want to feel guilt the next day when I'm working that I didn't spend actual valuable time connecting with my wife and kids because we're all sucking off the screen there. I don't screen suck anymore. I mean, imagine how many people fall asleep in this very room screen sucking the very last thing you did before you fell asleep, and now that's really impacting your subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. Instead, I'll still open up my notes, because remember, it's in airplane mode, so there's no notifications popping up, and I've turned off all notifications, but there's no text messages popping up. Open up my phone and write down my five things I'm going to attack the next morning. And so I do that brain dump the night before, I'm not screen sucking and reading bad news, bad emails. What, the problem's still going to be there tomorrow morning when I can actually do something about it with my VPs and my team leads, et cetera. In the evening time, I'm not going to stress about it. And so if you just focus on actually setting yourself up to win the night before by eliminating screens, by not hitting the snooze button in the morning because I'm convinced, and someone needs to do a study on this, that if you hit the snooze button first thing in the morning, you really are telling your subconscious mind that I'll take 10 more minutes of interrupted sleep over getting out and dominating my purpose in life. Uh, and I believe over time, that stacks up against you, like a stack of dominoes where the, you, know, you, you hit the I'm a loser domino and off it goes, right? Every morning, <laughs> it's like we have two stacks of dominoes to hit. If you hit the snooze button, you're hitting the I'm a loser stack. 
Uh, but those, that's been a big thing for me, man, uh, preparing the night before for the next morning. And we all know when you win your mornings, you win your days, you win your days, they add up into a massive amount of success in your life, whether it's family, health, happiness. Like when people tell me, gee, Bedros, you know, I just have a few more pounds to lose. It's like, fuck, man, we're all millionaires in here, right? We're all doing well. You, you can't hire a nutrition expert. You can't hire a, a personal trainer. Then it's like, well, I can, but I don't have the time. How do you not have the time? And I later found out they're not working in their 5%. And we've talked about your 5%, at least in the Genius Network groups that I've been in. One time, this was, I don't know, almost 11, 12 years ago, I was working out of my home. We didn't have an office then. My wife calls upstairs to the guest house, and she goes, hey, dude, sprinkler has a leak. It's like a fountain in our backyard. I said, oh, I'll be down and fix it. And so I went down to fix it, and I'm pretty handy with that stuff, but I got mud all over my arms. And the only employee I had was one assistant. Her name was Amanda at the time comes down and she goes, hey, people are responding to the email you just sent out. They actually want to get on the phone with you and see if uh, the coaching is right. I said, oh man, Amanda, I've got mud all over me. You've heard me do the clothes many a times. You got this. Now I'm asking Amanda to work outside of her 5%. I'm working outside of my 5%. What could have cost me $20 to pay someone else to fix that sprinkler, I lost a $5,000 sale. At the time it was $5,000. Today it's $50,000 The coach with me. But $5,000 to me might as well have been 50000 back then, 11 years ago. And that was the best lesson. And you all have your 5%. Most of you, it's delegate, motivate, and sell. You delegate to your team. You motivate your business partners, your clients, your team, and then you sell. That's it. Anything outside of that, if you're doing your laundry, if you're doing your grocery shopping, we've got a house manager her name is Valentina, and she does the shopping for us and changes the light bulb. Anything that's in the five, my wife says, hey, can you take out the garbage? You know, it's not on my 5%. Hey, the light bulb's out. It's not on my 5%. Hey, the sprinkler sprung a leak. It's not on my 5%. But now there's someone who can do it. You can afford to get another wife in your house or a, you know how I mean that. <laughs> Some of you know how I mean that. Yeah. Uh, but you, you, you really can. And you forget this, and my challenge to you is, why don't you buy back some of your time, focus on your 5% that matters, so you could really focus on what happiness is, which to me, it's money, meaning, health, and relationships. That's it. It's a simple formula, really. Well, you know, in 1997, I hired uh, Gary Halbert for, well, I think you both have maybe heard the, the Triple X Halbert tapes. I recorded it just on, you know, a little cassette player, and I... For myself, we ended up <laughs> distributing it as a product. And it was me and, uh, and Pamela Yellen and Gary Halbert, John Carlton. We're all sitting around in this hotel room because I was up there doing consulting with Bill Phillips at the time, Body for Life author. And basically, we're all making a list of if we were all millionaires, what are the things that we would have in our lives? And one thing that every person wrote down is a personal trainer. And then I think it was John Carlton that said, you don't need to be a millionaire to hire a personal trainer. You don't need to be a millionaire to hire a lot of these things. You can just, and as a matter of fact, by not doing it, it's one of the best ways to not become a millionaire because you spend all of your time doing what you just True explained. True enough. And you start to feel like an imposter in your industry. You really do because the content you're going to deliver on that video, you're not delivering it 100% because you don't feel comfortable in your own skin. How you're going to pitch from the stage, you don't feel 100%. Let me tell you. I'm in the fitness industry, and it's been 15 years since I've trained a client. But when I was in that stressful period of my life, seven to eight years ago, as we were growing Fit Body Bootcamp, I was 25 pounds fatter. And when I would get up on stage at Fitness Business Summit to sell, there's no surprise. I was selling five, six, seven mastermind coaching clients. Today, 90 to 100, 110 people come on board at a time. The difference is not my pitch. The difference is not anything else other than the fact that I feel authentic and that transfers to the audience. Now, I don't care what you think. Through transfers through video, through your email, through your, every, your mannerisms, your eye contact, every single thing, your stage presence. So work on you, man. Work on you first. It's so valuable. Love it. I uh, want to ask you both about how do you do, I mean, with what you're doing with uh, the franchises, I mean, how, how do you deal with the uh, information overload? I mean, you've touched on a lot of it uh, with just even the, you know, what you do in the morning, what you do the night before, but how, how do you deal with the sheer volume of yeah. stuff? And I mean, and everyone here has their own version of that. Yeah, and, and we're all leaders, and so you can, you can definitely, um, I know you've experienced this before, where you become the human bottleneck in your business, right? 
How often are you the one with the buck in your, in your hands and you don't know what to do with it because you got 10 other bucks that you got to do something with? You're the human bottleneck. And so I quickly learned that I can't be the boss that runs it. I, I forget who was up here yesterday. I think it was Tony who said, you know, you, you still have a job. You're a millionaire, but you still have a job. And so I'm a big believer in decentralized command. And all that simply means is I have two leaders, two VPs, VP of operations, v, VP of new business, uh, because as we bring on new, new franchises that I take equity in, you know, the VP of new business will make sure that they are running like Fit Body Bootcamp is running so that we have congruency and KPIs in place. But the VP of operations and VP of new business are the ones I meet with them 35, 40 minutes every day after my workout. They go and delegate to the team leads. Team leads delegate to, the, to their implementers, their department, and then they execute. And the simple formula is this. What is it that we're doing? How's it gonna look when it's done? And what is the deadline? That's it. So I just have to talk to my two VPs and they go and delegate, and then when it's done, we'll have a meeting on it, and I might say, well, I don't like how that works, or what if we did it this way? But again, I'm no longer the bottleneck in my business. And when you're the bottleneck, you know, you, now you start doing time theft from yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna cheat my, who was it, Todd Durkin. Todd Durkin, are you in here? Todd Durkin, remember you, you were saying that at some point, you're, I'm just gonna eat a protein bar and skip lunch. Eating engineered food is not food. I don't care if it's a protein bar, it's not food. And you start stealing time from yourself, from your family, from your sanity, from your workouts, from your sleep. Before long, you're having an anxiety attack, an essential tremor because the human body can't deal with that. So decentralized command, find leaders. As Tony said, let them fail, create the systems, and delegate to them. Anything you'd like to add? I just don't know how to do anything, mostly on, with tech stuff. So, I mean, he makes fun of me all the time. But, you know, I'm, on my phone, I have two apps, and that's all, that's all I have. Do you and still I, have a BlackBerry? I still have a seven-and-a-half-year-old BlackBerry that I use. Um, and you can't do anything on that thing. Uh, so I just avoid getting myself in trouble. I build a lot of systems because I'm a very weak person. Like anybody else, I get really tempted by things. And so I just keep myself out of harm's way. Just like, you know, I tell, if somebody comes to me for weight loss, you tell them to keep the crap out of the house. Yeah. It's the simplest thing to do. So keep yourself out of trouble. How can you keep yourself out of trouble? Just do like, go through your day and figure out what are the things that are causing me the most problems? What are the things that are getting me in the most trouble? And then figure out a way to keep them out of your life. So a lot of not to do's is a good place to start. Most people's most important list is their not to do list, not their to do list. You no, know, no, what you just said is, uh, it's, it's interesting. I'm a very weak person. Um, we all have areas where I've always liked, and you'll hear me talk about it, I'll, I'll, I'll ask different people, you know, what's your kryptonite? You know, what is, what is the sort of thing that gets you in the way? Because um, the best way to get out of a hole is to quit digging it. And people dig a lot of their own holes. And, and I see that with addiction. You know, uh, a, a lot of people here that are, workaholics, from my conversation with Gabor Mate, there's a, an understanding of where a lot of this stems from. It's just the things that a person becomes conditioned to that continues to build the, these dopamine hits. And so like phones is an example. If you have a workaholic problem or tendency or how, whatever you want to call it, but you're also doing all these other things that you are not strong with, that are these temptations. You know, if you're an alcoholic, you can't keep booze around the house. You know, if you're a food addict, you can't keep a bunch of freaking Snicker bars and shit everywhere. So you... Well, I, I use this analogy. Like, you know, if you have young kids, young kids bring home this, you know, they, they draw something. You can't figure out what it is. But they bring it home to you, right? And, they, and you give them their your approval. And it's like giving them a gold star, right? And so as entrepreneurs, we're getting gold stars from things. And, it, and so like the next time you watch a video that says hustle and grind, you know, 16 hours a day, and you're like, oh, I'm going to go and do that because, you know, I'm going to do that and I'm going to get a gold star from some guy on the internet because he's, he sees me hustling and grinding. But that's totally misaligned with your values and that's where you get in trouble. But... You keep on doing that. Next thing, oh, man, you're really working hard. You know, you, you know, I see you hustling, grinding. That's awesome. And you're getting positive reinforcement from the wrong thing. And so your actions are misaligned from your goals. And that's what causes what I call it's like the first world problem, which is, you know, the biggest stress is when we're not aligned in what we're doing. 
And so if you keep on, do, you know, you say you want this in your life, but your actions are taking you down here, there's always going to be that stress inside you until you align your actions with your goals, which is starting with your values and your vision. And so, you know, what I've seen Bedros do now, like Bedros is even better with his time than I am now. Like he gets done work at four o'clock, so he plays with his kids before dinner, has dinner with his family, plays with his kids after dinner, has time to watch one television show and, and hang out in the hot tub with his wife. I mean that, and run a, a business with 600 franchises. I mean, that's pretty good. Yannick. <laughs> you know, that, that actually ties into something that I truly, absolutely love and admire you for is, you know, the fun and the just that amazing DNA that you instill in, in all your businesses and the culture. And where does that come from? Does that come straight from you and, and it kind of bubbles down, top down, or is it literally just everybody is, it creates that? I think the chairman of a company uh, needs to be willing to let their hair down. Um, and if, you know, let's say if you take a party situation as an example, um, you know, if the uh, chairman of the company stands in the corner sipping sherry with his fellow directors, uh, as normally happens in a lot of uh, company parties, uh, everybody else in the room will be standing in huddled corners, yeah. um, you know, having boring conversations. Um, uh, if the chairman of the company is the first to throw themselves in the swimming pool and drag a whole lot of other people in with them, uh, everybody else will be in the swimming pool. They'll have the most memorable party they had in the year and they would have had fun. And that sort of spirit of fun can, be, can make it a fun company to work for. And therefore, you know, chairman of the company has to be a leader. I mean, it has to, um, you know, has, has to try to, you know, get that sort of spirit of, you know, spirit of fun in the company yeah. and not take themselves too seriously. I mean, obviously there's the serious side of running the business, which people will appreciate and expect. You know, if you're running an airline, you know, you've got to make sure <laughs> the planes fly and that the, uh, you know, in the daytime, the engineers don't drink and the, and the pilots don't drink when they're flying and so on. Um, you know, but uh, when, when people are off duty, uh, people should be able to have fun. And it's getting, you know, getting that balance. And I think that Virgin, you know, we've managed to get that balance. Um, you know, we've got the best safety record of any airline in the world. Um, you know, but that doesn't mean that our staff can't, can't have fun. And, it can, you know, and because they're having fun, because they enjoy the company they work for, you know, they're genuinely proud of the company, they smile, they're happy, and therefore uh, our passengers who fly on our planes, they smile, they're happy, um, and, uh, and they come back for more, and therefore we have a successful business. Okay, well, I mean, I think uh, we can all agree that we're all massive supporters of uh, business owners and entrepreneurs, and, and you believe that... Uh, um, of business owners having fun. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, totally. I mean, well, let, well first off, let me talk about that for a moment. You know, I mean, here we are on Necker, and we're bringing a group of people, all of us in our own businesses. Yannick has his Maverick Business Adventures, which mixes fun with uh, business and just, you know, allows people to do amazing, awesome things. Yeah. Marie? I, I wrote down a rule that you said yesterday, which was there's no work that can be done in the afternoon in Necker, and you literally <laughs> stepped in and said, we're not having this meeting at 4 o'clock, and and that's so amazing because it's like most entrepreneurs never take that time to, to just re-energize and, and regroup and. Yeah, and I think I, I think that um, you know you can you can have meetings after meetings after meetings which where people can actually end up being burnt out, whereas if you're having fun with people and get to know people, um, and you know that it, 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 getting to know people in fun situations. Um, uh, you can learn a lot more than perhaps in informal meetings. So, um, you know, so, yeah, we, we mustn't, mustn't eat into our fun time. <laughs> I mean, Peter Drucker said you're either working or you're in meetings. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I tend to like that. Okay, Richard, uh, I believe that you believe that uh, social and economic problems can be solved uh, in many ways through entrepreneurism, and I wanted to get your perspective on that. Yeah, I think it's worth making a one, one point, first of all, and that is that um, creating businesses in themselves uh, can, can solve um, social problems because by, by being an entrepreneur creating businesses uh, you create jobs um, by creating jobs um, you can help help take people out of poverty and obviously that applies you know uh, well that applies worldwide today I think I mean it's particularly with recessions and things around the world um, but equally I think that you know, once you've actually created a successful business and you feel that you know, the business is secure, um, I think if, if, if every business could then become a, 
a, a force for good. And you can use your entrepreneurial skills to think, how can we, as, you know, as a company, tackle a, a, a social problem in the local community, maybe, if you're quite a small business? Um, use our entrepreneurial skills to see how we can tackle it better than it's been tackled before. Or if you've created a, 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 a bigger business, you know, maybe how can we tackle you know, so some, of the, some of the seemingly intractable you know, global problems and, and again use our entrepreneurial skills to see how they can be tackled in a um, better way than they've been tackled before. And I think if every business could do that, um, an awful lot of the problems of the world would get resolved. So uh, you've had uh, the experience of, of meeting, I'm sure, just thousands of entrepreneurs over time and also helping to create them. Uh, is there any consistent mistake that you see entrepreneurs make in business that they could possibly avoid? I think, I think that if you don't protect um, the downside um, uh, and you sort of treat your business a bit like going into a gambling, gam gambling ca uh, casino and um, you know, sort of keeping on doubling up to, to uh, you know, hoping that you're going to get out of a, a problem, um, you know, then, then you're asking for trouble. And eight out of ten businesses do go bust. Um, uh, and quite often it's because people haven't um, thought of the... The, you know, the, the, the downside consequences of what they're doing. So uh, without being too conservative, um, it is important, I think, to uh, always think, you know, if I do this, what's the worst that can happen? Can I afford the worst? Um, you know, for instance, right now, you know, some of our airlines have protected against um, oil, oil going up. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people within our airlines said, well, look, it can't possibly go any higher. We've got a recession on. Um, you know, so do we really have to protect? Uh, the wiser people at, 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 at Virgin said, yes, you know, we, we should protect against the worst happening. Um, you know, so it was, it was good and sensible that they protected against the downside. I see you do that too, Richard. Uh, I mean, just as a great example is uh, like Virgin Mobile, as we'd say in the UK, but Virgin Mobile. And like just instead of buying, like building all the communication, all the all the infrastructure it would take, you literally leased, I think, Sprint's uh, lines, and so there's very little downside and very big upside if it worked for you. We have a strong brand, and therefore we're, we're able to avoid the enormous infrastructure costs of, um, of sometimes of building new businesses. We can piggyback on other people's uh, infrastructure um, using, using, using our brand, um, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put in the brand, we get 50% of the company will we'll use our marketing skills and other people put in the infrastructure. And, and, and that in itself also, as you say, protects the downside. Yeah. You know, um, with um, all the decisions that you have coming across your, your desk, your what, wherever you're at, uh, your beach, I guess it could be. Um, it, yeah, exactly. Um, how, how, do you, um, how do you make really tough uh, decisions um, on a daily basis? Because you're just you've got to be, you've got so many requests and demands of your time and people that want your attention in the world. And like, what's the Richard Branson methodology of, I guess, time management, priority management, really thinking it through? I mean, how do you, how do, you do all of this? Well, you know, we, we spoke about delegation. And I think the, the first thing is to make sure that everything is running without you. So, you know, if you know, when I'm swimming around the island every day, um, you know, if a shark comes and decides uh, that, that I look tasty and I disappear, uh, that, 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 you know, everything will, will continue to run. And, um, you know, it may not run ex in exactly the same way, but it will continue to run and Virgin will continue to grow. Um, the fact that ev everything is running, we've got a fantastic team of people on a global basis, um, it, it means that literally I can, you know, work, work out wh how I want to spend my day. Um, and I think, I, I think it, it's, it's absolutely essential for all of us that, um, that, we, that we stay fit and healthy um, uh, because, you know, if, if, if we're not fit and healthy, we're not going to be able to achieve anything. So, um, you know, so, you know, I will swim around the island uh, every day or I'll, you know, go kite surfing or I'll play tennis or I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do something to make sure that the body is healthy and uh, the endorphins are running uh, and... Um, and, and then I can throw myself into work. Um, and I suspect um, at least 50% of my time is sort of setting up not-for-profit uh, organizations in the world to tackle 
you know, some, some of the bigger problems of the world. Um, and, you know, the other 50%, I suspect, is diving in and out on, you know, some of our businesses around the world, you know, maybe doing a bit of firefighting when things are going wrong um, or, um, you know, giving them a push, you know, when things are going right. So I have a question that's a little more uh, personal in nature. I'm wondering when you first started. And <laughs> yes. Uh, when you first started and you were getting everything going, did you find it challenging, challenging at all to have uh, like any kind of balance? And because and, I know you love your kids so much and you love your wife so much. You know, when you're getting something going, you invest a lot of time in, in the ramp up stage. Did you ever deal with that sense of guilt of like, oh, man, I have to put the phone down or, oh, God, I have to just shut it off. You know what I mean? And spend time with my family. Well, I've done something which is slightly unusual, and I think um, you know, possibly it's the advantage of owning your own company, um, and that is I've, I've always worked from home. Um, so I've never uh, worked from an office. When I say never, not pretty well never. I mean, you know, right, right in the early days, um, you know, I'd pop in a lot to our record, co record company. Um, and um, uh, so I originally worked in a, in a houseboat. Um, you know, the kids would you know, be crawling around on the floor. I'd, I'd be having, you know, meetings with people. Uh, might even be changing a nappy. You know, so the kids literally, you know, grew up, um, you know, grew up with me as we were building the Virgin, the Virgin Empire. And, um, uh, and then when the kids' holiday time came, you know, we would pack the bags and I would just move my office, you know, to Necker Island. Um, and, you know, so I would always be around my family um, I suspect you know we're closer than you know closer than a lot of families because of that. Um, you know, yes, I would be you know spend quite a lot of time on the phone and you know I'd be busy, but we were around each other. Um, now I think the uh, if there's any lessons to be learned from that for other people, I mean I you know I do think that with modern communication, one one shouldn't have to get stuck in an office. Um, uh, you, you know, the more one can get out and about. Um, the better. Um, if you've got companies, go and you know go and um, live live your companies. Live you know spend a lot of time with your people, and spend as much time with your family as you can. Um, and you know I think getting that getting that balance is is absolutely critical. And um, and making sure that you bring up great kids who are happy and you know loving and you know, you found that time for them is is, is critical because they they are going to be the next generation. Yeah. Um, you know, what is your unique ability? I mean, what makes you Richard Branson? P people consider you charismatic, uh, friendly, funny. Um, good looking. I, mean, I don't want to say good looking. Terribly. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> yeah. To, no, I mean, what, 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 what makes you effective? I mean, so. You know, people look up to you as one of the most recognized, uh, successful, fun entrepreneurs uh, on the planet. I mean, what what makes you you? I think I think the, um, the the sort of fun side is is perhaps natural. I mean, I think you know I've always enjoyed having fun and making sure other people have fun around me. You know, whether it's um, you know, building a UFO and flying it over London on April Fool's Day. You know, many. You know, I was I was quite quite young when I did that and ca caused that absolute panic with the the police force and the army coming out and so on. Um, you know, but I think it's sort of it's natural. I think other people can you know who are maybe not naturally that way inclined. I think they can train themselves to uh, enjoy life more than they perhaps are, and they may be taking themselves too seriously. I think they can. You know, they, if they made it, make a real effort, they can also um, find a fun side in them. And I think you can train yourself out of... Uh, I mean, I'm, I've, I was an awful um, public speaker when I was young, and, um, uh, you know, some, and the amount of errs and ums, I, mean, I can now feel them coming back again. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, somebody once did an, did an interview with me, and they cut out all my ers and ums, my ers and ums were, were longer than the actual wor <laughs> wor words that were there. Um, and that, so I think, you can, I think you can train yourself, train yourself out of di you know, difficulties. Um, somebody said to me, you know, the, way to, you know, the, the way to overcome fear of public speaking is just think of yourself, you're in, in a living room 
having a chat with some friends, and uh, and and you know, and that helped me a lot. So I just fr from then on, I just have a chat with friends, and and it seems to man seem to manage all right. Um, but uh, but let's move on to another question. I can't remember. Well, no, no, wait. I I, I, I want to go a little deeper with that one just for a minute, though, because I mean, you you do some things that other human beings don't do, and it makes you really effective. And I and I've often wondered if if you ever identified that, or do you really not? Do you really not know? I mean, do you do you know what makes you powerful, and influential, and persuasive, and 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 causes people to want to surround themselves with you and get behind your causes and, and become a client of your businesses. I mean, what, what is the, what's the Richard Branson's secret sauce? I mean, have you, do, you, do you really know? <laughs> um, well, look, I think you are only as good as the reputation you've built over many years. And I hope, you know, that I've managed to build a, a good reputation and, um, and therefore, hopefully, people can you know can trust trust me. So, you know, if you if you look back over Richard Branson's life, um, there's the exciting side. You know, they, they, they're trying to you know be the first to fly around the world in a balloon, or you know, the fastest across the Atlantic in boats, and so on. And and I think that that sort of slightly sort of sexier side um, of my life. Uh, you know, the fun adventurous side has also helped the brand and helped make the brand a bit more interesting than say, you know, British Airways where the chairman, you know, hasn't put his life on the line too often. Um, and, then, and then there's the actual companies themselves, the fact that I think we have made, it, made quite a big difference to people's lives in, you know, whether it's, you know, if you fly on a plane or travel on a train or, um, uh, you know, or listen to music, etc. You know, I think in a lot of different areas we've made diff differences to people's lives. Um, and uh, so I think we, there, there is some substance there. You know, hopefully, then you know it's down to personality. Whether you whether whether you're good at dealing with people, whether people want to actually spend time with you, um, and you know whether you genuinely care about people. And I'm just extremely lucky. I love people. Love spending time with people. Love learning from people. Um, hopefully, I'm a, a, as good a listener. Uh, you know, which I think as a good leader has got to be a great listener, not not wanting to listen to themselves all the time. Now we were having a great conversation about this concept of return on genius. That everybody in this room, we're all entrepreneurs, we're all here by definition to turn things into a return on those investments. That's what we're doing here. And so the reason that we're here is to multiply the money and the time that we've spent to be here. And when we started talking, I've been thinking for a long time, and I think when I was with Dan last year, we mentioned this idea of the, the choice between focusing on how to do something or focusing on who can do something for you. And that how is a question that leads to just more time that you have to invest in learning how to do something, and then you have to spend time actually doing it, probably poorly, because you're doing it for the first time, something that you've just learned, whereas if you're focused on it, finding a who, somebody who can do what it is that you're looking to get done, the result that you're looking for, you instantly get to the done, and that allows you to move on and continue on. Now, yesterday, or a couple of days ago, I've been, I think this thought a lot, and I always look at how are we measuring our return on genius? And you look at the, rather than thinking about this type of an event as part of an educational budget or an expense that you're allocating to develop yourself, we look at it as more of a, a capital investment and over time, if you look at this instead of a $25,000 investment to be part of Genius Network for one year as part of your educational budget and then move over to something else, all the real return on Genius comes from uh, the cumulative effect, just like a compound interest table. If you think about this, and the way I think about it is as a 10-year investment of $250,000 over that 10 years and looking for what's going to drive that investment for a multiple of that money. Now, the distinction that I had yesterday or Tuesday when I was talking with Joe is that 
as we're moving now into this more, we're moving away from linear thinking and into exponential thinking, it dawned on me that, that how and doing are linear thoughts. They're linear processes. You can only learn how to do something by investing real linear time in doing it. And then you have to spend real linear time in actually doing what it is that you've learned. So our personal development is into learning new skills. That's kind of the old linear model. As we move into now this exponential world, you know, what and who are exponential things that you don't have to spend a fraction of the time in when your focus is on what to do and who can do it. I loved when, you know, this whole premise of thinking about what needs solved is the reason, the why that you're in the room and what we're all going to be exposed to. We've all got our own different what needs solved. And what we're, where the opportunity we have is to focus on what can we do that would solve that problem? So we look for and identify, well, that would be a good idea. I wanna get more leads for my business or I wanna, whatever, the, whatever it is that needs to be solved, you're gonna be exposed to what people have done. These are like field reports from geniuses that have spent their whole lives investing in their personal development to get to the result that we've got. Everybody in here has run or developed at least a million dollar business and has gotten to that point by being focused on their personal development, applying it to a very specific thing. Now, linear, you know, is personal development and it struck me that exponential is tapping into a genius network where you're mm -hmm. instantly, when you're tapped into a network and you have a relationship with other people who have spent just as much or more time in their personal development than you have, and you have instant access to the uh, cumulative effect of all of that time that they've spent in there, when you're focused on what they've done that gives you a clue as to what you could do to solve the same problem and look for the who's that can actually execute those things for you. There's such an exponential um, outcome from that. I remember, as I said, just offline, is that uh, I was there at the beginning of the Genius Network. The very first day, uh, the very first uh, day where we got together and, and swapped ideas at your apartment in Tempe, Arizona. And uh, I still remember that. And I'm so happy with your success and what you've accomplished and with so many other people. It's just wonderful. You know, we, we talked, I believe at that time, we talked about the mastermind concept. And that's why, and you said, well, why don't we get together and mastermind? And so I flew over to, uh, to, to, to Phoenix and, and taxied out to your house uh, for the first time. And uh, that's something that's so important in the Genius Network is the, when Napoleon Hill did his work, he said that every single person, the, the Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and so on, every one of them began to be successful and they began to mastermind with other intelligent people and just share ideas. And I have I've had the same experience because one idea in combination with your other ideas can change your life forever. Yeah. You know, I, I am, I'm happy to say, uh, some years ago, about, about a decade ago, a publisher said, um, have you got uh, any uh, books or anything that we could publish? And I said, well, uh, I've got a book on time management. So I sent them a manuscript and it was called uh, Double Your Income, Double Your Time Off. And he said, uh, great publisher, Barrett Kohler. And he said, well, it's kind of a boring title. He said, but the chapter 15 is 21 great ways to stop procrastinating and get more things done faster. That's the title of the book. And he said, well, chapter 15 is entitled Eat That Frog. And this is a story from Mark Twain. And Mark Twain was the most successful speaker, writer, author in America for three or four decades. And he wrote this. He said, he said if the first thing you do in the morning is you eat a live frog, then you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that it's probably the worst thing that can happen to you all day long. And your live frog is your biggest, ugliest task. Um, 
And so he said, just get up in the morning and just get it done. He said, and if you have to eat two frogs, eat the ugliest one first. Uh, so if you have two big tasks to do, eat the, do the most important. And then the, the other corollary is that if you do have to eat a frog at all, it doesn't pay to sit and look at it for very long. In other words, get on with it. Well, so he said, let's, let's make this the uh, title, Eat That Frog, and 21 Great Ways to Stop Procrastinating, and then run the theme through setting the table, organizing the plates, uh, and so on. And so I did. I sent it back to him, and they published it. And he just told me this week, um, Steve Persani, my publisher, is that we just hit 2 uh, million five hundred thousand sales in fifty languages. Wow! Uh, which is which me, makes me da -da 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 -da, uh, the best-selling time management author in history. Um, and it has one basic concept for us uh, with the Genius Network: is pick your most important task each morning and start on that task, and discipline yourself to work on that task nonstop until it's done and don't do anything else. If you can do this, which takes tremendous character, takes tremendous discipline, takes tremendous mental strength. If you can do this, the first time you do this, it will be very hard. You will be so distracted and you want to check your emails and make a call and get some coffee and so on. And what you have to do is you have to discipline yourself to stay at that wherever you are and do that task until it's done. Then I say, uh, give yourself a reward. The, the, you know, the time management author, Julie Morgenstein says, don't check your email in the morning. And I love that as a concept. So you get up in the morning, start on your most important task and discipline yourself to stay at it till it's complete. Then your reward is to check your email. But unfortunately, what do most people do is they check their email in the morning and in the afternoon and in the evening, they get up at night. They just always check in their email. And each time you check your email, the estimate, it takes 17 minutes for you to get back to work. It takes 17 minutes to, for you to get settled down and mm, back to work and so on. And then somebody sends you an email and it goes bing, ding, bing, bing, and you stop You're doing, and you check your email again. And the email is one of the most wonderful communications devices in the world, but it'll kill you if you just keep checking it. So what you do is you turn it off. There's, I, I always say, leave it off, leave it off. Start your task and discipline yourself and your big reward when you finish your most important task is now you can check your email. And if you can do that, what happens is you start to become so productive. So many people have told me that they became millionaires with the eat that frog concept. Just start and complete your most important task. But if you can't do that, by the way, you'll always have to work for someone else who can discipline you to do it, someone who will supervise you, someone who will check on you. Uh, what will happen is you'll always be in the bottom 80%. You'll never be a big success. And remember this 80-20 rule, it, it, it is, um, bites you in the bum all the time. And 20% of people make all the money. The 80% of people, why do you think we're having riots today? Who do you think's rioting? Certainly not the top 20%. They're busy making money. It's the people in the bottom 80% who are frustrated and, and, and angry and upset and so on because uh, they have too many bills, as they say, too much month at the end of the money. Uh, they don't know how to get out of it. The answer is, is make a list of what you have to do, pick the most important task and work at it till it's done. Your whole life will change. Let's talk for a few minutes about what it means to be the best. And as you know, this is a group of high achievers and a lot yeah. of people in here are, you know, are among the best or the best at what they do. Sometimes it's hard to know what's, who's among the best and who's the best, right? Um, we actually have an, another, other than yourself, another world-class athlete in the, room, in the room here in Arizona, which is Whitney Jones, who was just for the third time crowned Ms. Fitness Olympia. So, uh, oh. and we acknowledged her earlier and, and, you know, we talked a little bit about the ironclad mindset that enables mastery of the physical self, right? Yeah. It, it reminded me of the story you've told many times in front of your group where I've had the honor to, 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 to be present and participate a few times. And you, you referenced it before about your high school, you know, 
for all the years before, all the years since. Nobody's yeah. been to a pro. Nobody made it to a pro sport. Certainly not to the NFL or maybe any other league. But when you were there, there were, a, and maybe with your brother Tony as well. But certainly your mindset. And your commitment to what your plan was elevated some people around you, <laughs> right? And so yeah. that happens in a business also, I would suggest, yeah. right? But what, what is the dynamic when you are ironclad about what is going to be happening in your future? What is the dynamic that elevates the people around you either to a similar goal but, or even more like tangibly to this group? in a business and people get on board that train and you know it's like francis ford coppola says the biggest challenge in making a movie is getting everyone to make the same movie yeah right so it's like how how does how does your ironclad mindset or how did it and how does it elevate those around you yeah it's it's so true that it, that, that is 100 percent true so in my case you know the, the story that michael referenced I went to a high school that had like 280 kids. It was a little country farm, uh, all farmers, kids, right, that went to school there. So I played football, 27 farm boys were on my high school football team, right? Um, and there's never been a, a pro athlete of any kind come from my high school in 100 years, not before I got there, not since I left, right? So there's never been one. And, and the odds of playing pro football are 0.03%. 0.03% high school football players play pro football, right? So the odds aren't great. But the high school I went to, who never had a uh, any kind of athlete in 100 years, four of us, four of the 27, which is uh, statistically impossible, all played pro football. And two of them went played in the Super Bowl. Four guys out of 27 with the, with the odds of 0.03 of every high school football player. That was the odds, right? Um, so how do you explain that? And I, uh, I was shocked. I, I didn't even think anything of it. I just thought that most people played pro football. I didn't realize that the statistics were so bad. I didn't realize that there was no way I was playing pro football and there was no way my brother was and there was no way two of my best friends were, but it happened. So I asked them and I asked the rest of the team, why did this happen? This is at a 30 year career, a 30 year reunion, Michael. So we're at a 30 year reunion. I went around to the guys and I said, why did this happen? This is a statistical impossibility. And they all said the same thing. They all said it was that damn plan that you were walking around with. <laughs> I carried around, and some of you have seen it, a, a, a plan that is 50 years old now, uh, 51 years old now, and it says that I'm to be the best safety in the world, right? But no one thought that was going to happen, but I just kept saying it and saying it, and at the 30 year reunion, what happened was these guys said, well, I just thought, you know, you were like, you weren't the biggest player, you weren't our best player, but you were committed to the, this piece of paper. And so they said to themselves, well, shit, if Bo, you know, being the size that he is, is gonna play pro football, then I certainly am too. And so that drug, three guys who maybe wouldn't have thought of it on to play in the NFL against those odds. So I thought to myself after those 30 years, like, damn, I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep telling people my dream, even though it's impossible. And what I have found out is people go with you. They're, they go with you wherever you're going. Now, your dream might be different than, than other people, but they see that you're kind of unreasonable about your own dream. And you're, you've got um, a loyalty not to the culture and not to the odds of you achieving it, but you have a loyalty to the piece of paper. 
And I have found that if you just stay loyal to that instead of, you know, what the odds tell you or what people tell you or what the news media might tell you, um, then that dream you will end up at, uh, you will end up with a gold medal around your neck. And then what, what the most shocking part of it all, Michael, is so will the people closest to you. The people who people will eliminate themselves, of course, from your presence. They will, because you know it, that ain't easy. That that kind of that gold medals are just not easy, as you all know. Um, get being an entrepreneur and reaching the very pinnacle that ain't easy. There's a lot of skin knees. There's a lot of bloody noses, and there's a lot of people who extricate themselves from you. Um. But if you hang in there and you stay loyal to that original vision, that original dream, not only will you have a gold medal around your neck, everybody you admire and respect will have one too. And I said that, you know what, that's the coolest thing ever. So, and then Michael, let me just, let me just say this one, one thing too. And it's, it's true of my life. It's true of everybody's life that's ever done this. Um, um, so uh, my son, Axel, he's 14 now, so he's a freshman in high school. So we took him out of the high school he was in and put him in one that the most elite athletes are at, right? Because his dream, his ultimate dream is to be, if, if his dream is going to come true, you guys, he's going to have to end up being maybe the best athlete we've ever had, if it's to come true. Um, so if he's around people who are better than him and are a step and a half ahead of him, I know that's going to be painful for him. It's going to be painful for me and my wife and, you know, the rest of the family. But if that's his dream, that's the only way to get there. Because if he's the best athlete at 14 at his high school, he ain't going to make it. Mm. because he goes to a high school called Sierra Canyon. So LeBron James's kid is on that basketball team. Dwayne Wade's kid is on that basketball team. Scotty Pippen's kid is on their basketball team. And now Axel, a 14 year old is going to be standing among them and getting his butt kicked right at the age of 14. But what does it look like for him at the age of 21? You can't be the best, you guys, at 14. You've got to surround yourself with a demanding situation. That's the only way, right? And that's, that's why this group is so great. And that's why, Michael, your group is the same way. When you go into Genius Network and you go into Consumer Health Summit, you go in and now you're sitting in tall, what my dad used to call tall cotton. He goes, boy, I want you standing in tall cotton. And when you're standing in tall cotton, you got to rise to the occasion or you're going to get stickers all on you. You got to rise above and you got to be, that's a demanding situation. And it's the only situation that you, that's going to demand you adapt. If you're the best in the room, you're the smartest in the room, you know, you you, you can't, your body will not adapt. Well, what's the one thing us human beings are the best in the world at? Automatically, naturally. We have proved over time that we're the best at adaptation to demanding situations, whether that's weather or lack of food or lack of mates. You and me know how to adapt. So for me, I wish my kid had, had an easier time, but he, did, he should have chosen an easier dream. Other, but now he is getting his butt kicked by guys mm. who are better than him, who are faster than him, who are bigger than him. So what is that demand of my son? He's got to rise. He's got to adapt to the demanding situation that his dream requires. Well, now let's look at us. Let's look at us. Let's look at our jobs. If you're the, if you're the best and you're shoulder to shoulder and you look and you left, oh, uh, I'm in Consumer Health Summit. Oh, shit, there's Ann Shippey over there. Oh, shit, there's, you know, Dr. Mike Harmon over there. You, you're like, damn, I didn't know shit. 
I thought I knew, I don't know anything now. Now that I'm standing among this, but I gotta rise and my body will adapt and now I'll be better walking out of here. That's what you must surround yourself with, but it is the most humiliating thing in the world to do. But it's the only way to get to the top. And then I'll finish with this. Once you're there, once you're at the top, and every Olympic champion knows this, you're no longer at the top. Once you're at the top, you're just at the bottom of the next summit, right? Because there's some young person or some smarter person or somebody's willing to outwork you right on your tail. Mm. And that's the beauty of this thing. I'm not saying it's like the funnest, if funnest is a word, it's not the funnest life, right? But I think it's, our, it's, it's what we're made to do. And it's a, it's a life worth living, that. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's the best. The beauty of the best, Michael, is you just never get there. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, right. Unless you're in a competition where, it's, where somebody actually wins or has the points or whatever. And I, I want to leave room for a couple of questions uh, as long as you have time, Bo. Yeah. Um, but just one question in pra- for practicality sake for this group, and you, you kind of touched on it, but like there's people in this group from maybe their late 20s at the youngest to their late 70s at, you know, at, at the oldest and like every decade in between. And, you know, you've heard, you've heard the phrase, um, don't try to be better than other people, just be better than yourself, mm-hmm. right? Like just get better than you were yesterday, right? Is that... Is, is that worth sort of heeding, you know, and because, because, because look, we're, we're, these are entrepreneurs and founders, you know, ha, what, what is the practical application of being, of, of being the best other than to elevate yourself? Yeah, I mean, it, you're right, I'm Michael. I mean, it's, it's like, he, for me, <clears throat> Being that, you know, all of us have survived this long because our ancestors were the ultimate competitors, right? So we have that blood in us. We're ultimate competitors. It's, 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 you know, if you look at the first rule of biology, the first rule of biology is competition, right? So we're not, I know that word is kind of frowned upon these days, but I kind of like it. And I like that it's being frowned upon. Um, and we know how to compete. We know how to compete for mates, for food, for shelter. We, we have it in us. Um, so a lot of times that's not against another person, right? It's against yourself. I always have been, I always put somebody in front of me. Like if that's a football player or an author that I admire or a speaker that I look up to, I go, I want to be better than her. I want to be better than them. And I start to compete no different than an athlete would compete, right? Then eventually, given enough time and effort, I pass them. And then you know what I do? I start competing against my last performance. Mm. Like Tom Brady, who is he competing against? He's only competing against his performance last week or the last Super Bowl. Because there's no one in in his stratosphere. And by the way, he's the oldest dude. So he's playing, Michael, and I think you just touched on it. And I didn't think of this until now. He's playing the game you're talking about playing. He's playing a whole different game. All those other guys in the National Football League, all 1,500, they're playing this game of football, trying to win, right? And some are trying to be famous, and some are trying to get a big contract. He's not playing those games. He's playing a game that he is the last man standing, right? And that's a different game. The rest of them, they're not really playing that game. They're trying to get attention, trying to build... Um, Instagram accounts. He's not playing that game. He's playing the ultimate game, which is he's the del- he, he's going to win. And mm. it's funny because he does win, and he wins with teams that shouldn't win. So if you start to study uh, what he's doing, Michael, and I think you you just touched upon this. I'm just going to name it, and I'll I'll, I'll shut up. He's doing something that the rest of the world is really not doing. 
and I, I, I admire this about him. He's at, th think about this. He's doing what he's actually doing. There's 32 quarterbacks in the NFL. They're great. They're elite. They're awesome. My brother was one of them, and a lot of my best friends were them, okay? These guys are great guys. These guys are freaking talented, and they are driven, and they are leaders from the word go. I think Tom Brady is the only guy doing what he's doing, which is playing the position of quarterback. I think the other 31, and I'm not saying they're not great, I think the other 31 are doing something other than they're playing quarterback to get something, to have something, whether it's money, fame, uh, girls, uh, the, the perks that come with being a quarterback, the wardrobe, the Instagram accounts, they're playing a different game than he's playing, which is the only reason why he can win at such an ancient age. I mean, he's 44 years old, you guys. That's, imp that's an impossibility mm. that he's the best player in the league. At 44 years, that's mm. like 100 to you and me. <laughs> right? Yeah. He, he's not, you guys, he's not a great athlete. He's, he ain't the best athlete out there. That's for damn sure. He, but he is, you never see him on commercials, very rarely. You never see him promoting this or that and all this kind of nonsense. He is playing the position of quarterback. Do you know what the number one thing, and this goes to you and me, do you know what the number one thing that you have to have <clears throat> to be a quarterback in the NFL? Do you know what the number one thing is? This goes for you and me. Trustworthiness trustworthiness that is the number one quality of an nfl quarterback he is the most trustworthy to the people around him they trust he's going to lead them to victory what if you and me what if the thing we had most and i can say this a hundred percent for you michael trustworthiness is the thing that people are attracted to about you because we it's predictable what my life, Bo's life, is going to be like if I'm with Michael Fishman. You can see that, right, Michael? That's, that, you know, you're not bragging. You're just saying, yeah, your life, Bo, is going to be predictable if you're around me. Yeah. If we're buddies or I'm a client or, or we're just partner, we're in a partnership, it is very predictable what happens to Bo's life. That's called trustworthiness, you guys. Mm -hmm. No one has this anymore. No one has it because they're not playing the ultimate game. Tom Brady, <laughs> Michael Fishman make everybody around them great. <laughs> Right? And that's what you guys do too. If you think about it, that's why you're successful. You make people around you see their own greatness and they live into it. That's called trustworthiness. That's called a predictable life. That's the life everybody wants right now because everything's too unknown. I want my life to be predictable. Oh, then I'll saddle up with Michael Fishman or Joe Polish or, you know, or whoever or Tom Brady. Okay, I hope you found that video awesome and useful. So if you want to get a free copy of my book, I want you to click here. And if you want to watch some more videos that will be useful and awesome, click here. Go ahead. You're over here. Do it now. Come on. Thank you. Watch it.